Thank you again so much, ladies. Uh, on Thursday, I had spoken with Shep, and he had told me he was going to be grilling some wings that night. And on Friday morning when we, when we got in uh, here, uh, I said, how were the wings last night? And he said, they were unbelievably good. He said, uh, probably the best wings I've ever cooked. <clears throat> I said, I, I cooked uh, some steaks last night. They were unbelievably tough. <laughs> unbelievably tough. If you've had steak enough times in your life, odds are you have had at least a time or two a tough steak. And if you've had a tough steak, hopefully you recognize this. They don't simply show up. There's a reason, there's a rationale, there's a plausible explanation as to why you wound up with a tough piece of meat. Now, one of the reasons that you can wind up with a tough steak has to do with cooking itself. And uh, for those of you who like a well-done steak, uh, especially the, the, the more well-done that you get, the closer you get to shoe leather, right? And so um, if you cook it until the, until the point there's, there's no juice, nothing left, well then uh, it will be a, a tough steak. But that's not the only thing. In fact, I would suggest that's not actually even the, the, the determining factor as to whether or not a steak is going to be tough or not. I, I think the determining factor is the type of meat or the cut of meat that it actually is. Certain cuts of meat are known to be more tender, known to be more lean. Some cuts of meat are known to be more tender. For example, the tender loin, right? That's, that's a tender cut of meat. It is lean, it is tender, but because of that, it's also the most expensive, right? And butchers understand that, that these are desirable attributes. There's less of that type of meat on a cow, and so that drives the price up. And, of course, we have, I don't know, 100, 200 children or so, and so because of this, we're not going to be eating fillets at our house. In fact, we don't have steak very much, but, uh, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, I was at Sam's, and I had this idea. And I, started, I talked to the butcher. I said, there's got to be a cut of meat where I can get like a whole hunk of something, like almost like a whole tenderloin, except not a tenderloin, but a different cut that, that you could cut steaks off of that maybe even if I work with it a little bit could make it more tender and come out uh, saving a lot of money. And so he directed me to this, this hunk of meat. It was called Top... I don't remember. Top... I think Hoof is what... It was. <laughs> <laughs> what, what he led me over to. And, and he explained this. He said, a lot of people, they, they overlook this. He said, but you can work with this. And he said, uh, this can turn out really well. Anyway, it was this, this hunk of meat, and it was 10 pounds or more. And the, the price of this, was, it was less than $30. And he said, I can cut this into steaks for you. Uh, and so he did that. And as I recall, I got 22 or 23 steaks off of this hunk of meat. For less than $30. I am excited. I'm crazy excited. And so I remember the next day uh, after I'd done that, I, I told Shep about this great deal. And I was so excited about being able to, to cook one of these steaks. And so on Thursday night, I cooked some of these steaks. <laughs> and um, have you ever had beef jerky? <laughs> Well, if you have, then you know exactly what it is that we were dealing with the other night. And uh, if you thought the ice in your driveway was tough, you should have dealt with some of these steaks. They were just terrible. Now, Flower Pot, our dog, loves bad steak night, though. She, she came out as the real winner in this. But anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm telling Chef about this, uh, that these were so unbelievably tough. And he says, that's what you get for buying gully jumpers. He said, I, if you go in and buy the cheapest piece of meat, you're going to get the piece of meat that has been most exercised and has the most connective tissue in it, and that's exactly what I've gotten. And so if you want to write that in your Bible today, lesson, do not say, what's the most amount of stakes I can get for this amount of money? Because you will wind up with a tough, tough steak. They don't just show up out of nowhere. There is a reason there's a plausible explanation as to why they show up. Last week we began a series looking at the life of Noah that we've been calling, or I've called solitaire. Standing firm while standing alone. And whether you were here last week or not, I just want us to be on the same page. 
if you are someone that says, hey, I'm a follower of God, I've got a personal relationship with the Lord, hopefully you recognize that if you attempt to be serious about following the Lord in this environment, in this culture, there's going to be a lot of pushback. You, you will very quickly discover that you are not with the crowd, you are very much increasingly in isolation. And the more serious that you attempt to be in living out your commitment to Christ, the more lonely your experience is going to become. And at some points and places, you'll feel as though you're absolutely playing a game of solitaire, that you are by yourself. I get it, and I understand, and hopefully we can all agree that the culture in which we operate in is not one that is friendly, is not one that is welcoming of Christian standards and godly virtues. Our society is heading in the opposite direction. That being said, I want you to understand this, and this was a takeaway from last week. It has never been as bad as it was in Noah's day. As bad as, as it is presently, or as bad as it has been in previous years, in previous places, the truth is it has never been fully as bad as it was in Noah's day. Yet, Noah stood with and for the Lord, even having to do so alone. And the application is this, if it can be, and if it was done in the worst of times, it can still be done in these times. Noah stood alone, but he stood with and for the Lord. The question is this, how did that happen? This doesn't occur in isolation, it has a plausible explanation that we see in Genesis chapter 6. Look with me in your Bibles there this morning, Genesis chapter 6. As you're, as you're looking there, and you might have already uh, found that, look just a few verses ahead to chapter 7, verse 1. And God is talking to Noah, and he says this, I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. So God sees that Noah, and Noah alone is taking serious this whole idea of following the Lord standing with and for the Lord. He does so, and he does so alone. How did that happen? Chapter 6 answers the question for us. Look with me in verse 1. When mankind began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful, and they took any they chose as wise for themselves. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever, because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth both in those days and afterward. When the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them, they were the powerful men of old, the famous men. When the Lord saw that human, human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was on nothing but evil all the time, the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and was deeply grieved. And the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created off the face of the earth together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I have made them. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. These are the family records of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with with wickedness. All right, so it is these 11 verses that answer the question for us. How is it that chapter 7, verse 1 becomes a reality? How is it that God saw and found Noah alone as being righteous among his generation? All right, how does this text answer that? Look with me at verses 1 through 4. And, and let me, before we begin to answer that question, I've got to deal with these first four verses. These are verses that have created a considerable amount of consternation and tons of question, legions of speculative answers and explanations. And the, the operative terms in those verses that are, have created such question are these. The sons of God, the daughters of men, and the Nephilim. 
Who exactly are these? What's the relationship? What is it that's going on? And there are some who have speculated and, and, and written extensively and exhaustively on this. And, and this is their position. And honestly, many of these are people that I sincerely and deeply respect. And I think they're right on tons of things. Uh, but th this, these are... And this is a, a very popular position to explain those first four verses. The thought is this. That... God had created mankind, so you had Adam and Eve and all those that would follow. Prior to creating all these people, though, there were angels that God had created, and, of course, Satan had rebelled and took a third of the angelic host with him. And the, the daughters of men reference the, the, the human lineage coming from Adam and Eve. And the sons of God are a reference to angels, specifically fallen angels. And the position is this, the, the theory is this, that these fallen angels somehow had sexual union with mankind and produced this hybrid race known as the Nephilim. Let me just say, out of the gate, I don't subscribe to that position. Even, even though there are plenty of others that, that do, people that I respect, and candidly, a lot of these are people that I respect that are far smarter than I am. I still disagree with them. I don't think that they're right, and I say that for three reasons. The first is this. There is nowhere, anywhere in Scripture where anything of the sort even remotely happens, that you have a spiritual being, an angel, in this case fallen, having sexual relations with a mortal being. I mean, how exactly does that work? I mean, that's, that's something that happens among kind, physical and physical, not spiritual and physical. There's nowhere, anywhere in Scripture that gives us anything of the sort that something like this could have occurred. The, the, the second reason is this. As this passage unfolds, you see that God is dispensing judgment. He's getting ready to dole out significant judgment. In fact, he's getting ready to dole out judgment on the entirety of humankind because of its pervasive wickedness. He deals specifically with mankind, but there's no mention of angels, fallen or otherwise. If, if these were fallen angels that had engaged in this type of behavior, you've got to think that God would have addressed their wickedness and what they had done, just as he did in Genesis chapter 3 with Lucifer. So there's that. The other, the other thought is this. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First five books of the Bible, we, and, and, and widely it is accepted that Moses is the author of these. Consistently, you see throughout Scripture that biblical authors use, use, ver, use words consistently. The next time you see the word, and in fact the only other time that you see the word Nephilim mentioned, is over in Numbers chapter 13 where the spies have come back with their report from the inhabitants of Canaan. And you remember that 11, or excuse me, 10 of the 12 spies said, Hey, wait a minute, uh, we are like grasshoppers compared to these giants. And the word that's used are, or is, is the word Nephilim. This, I believe, is a reference simply to a group of people that happen to be particularly tall. So you, you say, well, all right, all right, Michael, I hear what you say as to why you don't think that's the case, why that's the explanation of what these verses mean and who the sons of God and the daughters of men are and who the Nephilim are. So, so what do you think? I, 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 let me just tell you this, and I say this with absolute certainty. I do not know. I do not know. And I, I could give you and speculate a bit, and I could give you a, a thought as to what I may think, but at the end of the day, that is still speculation. And the temptation for us is this. We can, and in fact, this is not the only place in Scripture where, where we are dealing with something where we're left perplexed as to what the explanation is. And when those instances come, and here they, they come in Genesis chapter 6, the temptation for us is to get bogged down in the mud and say, well, we've got to figure out exactly what this is. And if it's not this, then it has to be that. Or what about this? And we come up with all of these, the, these, these possible scenarios that would explain or interpret what these particular passages mean. The, the danger in that and the challenge with getting stuck in that is this. 
it overlooks the fact that God did not give us explanatory detail. He just didn't. God didn't spell it out for us. And the temptation for us is to get bogged down on the stuff that God didn't spell out and miss the stuff that he did spell out. Who exactly these people are, what exactly is going on in the first four verses, we cannot say with any certainty. But what I can say with certainty is this. That's not the point of this passage. That's not the thrust of this passage. If you say something, and if God says something once, does he mean it? Yes. If God says something once, is it true? Yes. If God says something twice, is it true? Well, certainly. If he says it three times... If he says it four times, if he says it five times, doesn't that suggest that God is attempting to be very and explicitly clear in something? Look with me at verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3, the Lord says, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever. Why? Because they are corrupt. Verse 5, When the Lord saw that human wickedness was widespread on the earth, Look at verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. That's three times. The earth was filled with wickedness four times. Verse 12, God saw how corrupt the earth was for every creature had corrupted its way on the earth five times. Verse 13, the earth is filled with wickedness six times. Is there something that God is clear about? Absolutely, there is something he's clear about, and that is the widespread, comprehensive, exhaustive wickedness of, of what was going on in Noah's day. And that with the exception of Noah, and verse 1 of chapter 7 says that Noah was, he, he was the only exception to this. Consistently, throughout the world, essentially what you have people doing is waving their fist at God, saying, hey, we're going to do things our own way. And God has established the, the boundaries of, of how we're to operate in life. We have these stories that have been shared and these, uh, these expectations that God has placed on us. But we do not care. We're going to do what we want, regardless of where the boundaries are, regardless of where the foul lines are. God is consistently clear in, making, in painting the picture for us of just how bad it was. Widespread corrupt. Widespread wickedness. Noah and Noah alone stood with and for the Lord. So again, the question is, how did he wind up in that place? Sometimes we can answer a question directly. So you can say, well, how do you make a cake? Well, you mix this ingredient, this ingredient, this ingredient, this ingredient, and so that's how you do it. Sometimes, though, the best way to answer a question is by telling and, and coming to understand what the answer is not. And I want to do that with you this morning. How is it that verse 1 of chapter 7 becomes a reality, that Noah stands and stands alone? Let me tell you how it, first of all, did not happen. It did not happen, first of all, because of geography. It did not happen, and it was not because of geography. What does that mean? What do I mean by that? It's pretty simple. Noah lived among all of these same people who are mentioned. We spent some time last week looking back, and if you weren't here, you can go back and read chapter 5. You have this, this lineage that goes from Adam all the way down to Noah, 10 generations. And people were living these exceptionally long periods of time and, and having, because of that, insane, almost certainly insane numbers of children, or what we would consider to be insane numbers of children. I mean, for goodness sake, Noah himself has children at 500 years old. So you, you have the, these, these massive numbers of individuals that comprise a family. One of the things that you need to keep in mind is this. Families, not only in Noah's day, but for the longest time, and throughout, the, the, in particular, the course of Old Testament history, you don't just have a family. And when you're dealing with a family, you're not dealing with just an individual unit. You're dealing, more often than not, with a clan. By that, I mean this. You may have a, a man and his wife and their children. In that same home... And if not in that same home, very close by will be their parents and their brothers and sisters and their spouses and their kids. And if they're living, the grandparents and their other sons and daughters and their families. And if they're living, the great-grandparents, that you'll have an area that is this whole 
clan of people that, that are in a particular area. In fact, in the, in, in even in, in U.S. history, in fact, the more rural the area, how many times, and some of you came from some very rural areas where there were a few prominent names in the community, right? Um, I, I came from Charlotte. Over the, over the line in Union County, uh, the description was there's more helms than people in Union County. Just tons of helms. That was a very prominent name. The area that you're from, there might have been a, a, a very prominent family. You had like a, a, a clan of people. Such was the case in Noah's day. Keep in mind not only that, but the fact that they're living so blessedly long. So they're, they're, they're living long, and you got all of these people together. Noah was not, and we have to, to and I think we can say this with, with near certainty, Noah was not living out in isolation. He would have been living among these people who are listed. He's, he's not operating out in the boonies, not operating, uh, living in a cave off to himself. This is somebody that is living among the people of the day, yet what? Verse 1 of chapter 7 is true that God says, I have seen that you alone are righteous before me in this generation. So Noah is in the... He, he's experiencing the same geography as these other people, but they're headed in one direction, and Noah is headed in the opposite. This tells us that it is not where you are or where it is that you are from that will determine whether it is that you stand with and for God. You say, okay, what does that have to do with me? What's the big deal about this? It is a big deal because of the excuses and the rationales that people can give. By that, I mean this. There are some today, in fact, probably quite a few in this room, maybe even a ton of people in this room today who would say this. Michael, I am a follower of Christ. I mean, there was a time in my life where I crossed the threshold of faith and began a personal relationship with Christ. That's true. It's also true, though, that how things are is neither what they could be or should be. I mean, I'm part of the family, but not really close. For the, for the high school student, they may say this. Because they're aware things are not what they could be or should be, there's this sense of, of, of guilt or conviction over that. But that, that guilt is assuaged and that conscience is appeased by this type of explanation. Well, I'm, I'm over it at Ragsdale. And if, if I weren't at Ragsdale, and instead if I were over maybe at Vandalia Christian or if I were over at, at um, uh, High Point Christian Academy... Maybe if I were homeschooled. If I were in a different place, if I were in a different environment, if I went to school in a different location, things would be different. Or it may be the, the adult that says, you know what, um, if, if I weren't working in the same place as I am now, Maybe out on the loading dock or in the, in the office where this, this um, break room space is shared where you find yourself sharing in the same language, laughing at the same things, engaged in the same behaviors, perhaps even practicing the same unethical, unchristlike, unchristian practices. The thought is this, well, th this is just kind of where I am and you've got to kind of go along to get along. If I, were in a different, if I worked somewhere else, if I were working over at Lifeway, it wouldn't be that way, but this is where I am. And I, I kind of feel bad about that, but if, my lo if, 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 if I were somewhere else, it would be different. All I'm going to say is this. That's, that's not the case. Changing geography does not change whether it is that you're going to take serious this whole idea of following the Lord. You can bring a duck into your house, but it doesn't make it like waterless. Noah is among his clan, his father Lamech. Now, Lamech died before the flood. Methuselah lived 969 years. He died the year of the flood. I believe sincerely that Noah's own grandfather died in the flood. Noah's grandfather shared 243 years with Adam. These are the people that Noah shared space with. 
but neither they or their children. Because Noah's father it said he had other sons and daughters. Methuselah had other sons and daughters. His father, Enoch, had other sons and daughters. None of these people or their descendants is spared. None of these other people is described as those that follow the Lord. It was Noah and Noah alone in his day. How did he wind up there? Well, to answer it negatively, you say, well, it wasn't his geography. You'd have to also say this as an extension of that. It was not his genealogy. It was not his genealogy. Again, verse 1 of chapter 7 says that Noah alone was righteous in God's eyes in his generation. Back in chapter 5, you have ten generations from Adam all the way down to Noah described. Well, we looked at some of the details last week, and about, and I just mentioned Methuselah, he lived 969 years, shared 243 years of time with Adam. In fact, Noah's own father was 56 years old when, uh, when Adam finally died. Noah is the first person in, his, first in, in that whole line that did not live as a contemporary of Adam. That's crazy. You see, it had all these people living in the same place, in the same time, for all of these, these centuries, and not only are they sharing the same space, they're sharing the same lineage. They all can trace themselves back exactly as Noah is, as exactly as Noah could. But what was said of them? Nothing. They lost their lives in the flood. They were wiped off the face of the earth, and God said only to Noah, you alone are righteous before me in this generation. It was not Noah's geography, and it was not his genealogy. Don't misunderstand me, and I want to be very clear in this. Not only is it that I believe, I believe that the Bible communicates that God expects the home, the family, to be the seedbed of faith. That, that more than the church, more than Bible school, more than Sunday school, more than any place else, where children should be exposed to God and the things of God and the truths of God primarily is in the home. Everything else, all the stuff here, supplemental. The home is to be the seedbed of faith. That's how God expects, among other things, that this, this whole idea of following him actually gets passed on from generation to generation. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that there's a biblical case to be made for that. However, understand this. You do not have to have had that to be able to be a real and committed, sincere follower of Christ. In fact, some of you who are here today can say amen to that because that's certainly not me. I mean, I, I grew up in a home where... Nobody thought any of Some of you had alcoholic parents or a drunk father that perhaps even an abusive situation. Maybe there was gross immorality and there's, there's questions as to who even uh, the, the, the identity of the parents was. And th th there's all of this scenario that, that anything that would be used to describe the home environment in which you grew up in, Christian is not at all on that list. Yet you somehow were able to be exposed to the claims of God, to the truths of the Bible, and you responded by faith, and God changed everything. Again, God intends for the home to be the seedbed of faith, but it does not have to be that way. In fact, even when there is a very Christian environment, it does not mean necessarily that the children are going to follow in step. Noah did not wind up being alone in his generation as a follower, standing with and for God because of his family, because of his genealogy. And it wasn't because of his geography. Beyond that, it wasn't because of opportunity. By that I mean, I, Noah does not stand with and for the Lord because he had unique opportunities that other people did not have. Follow me in, in, in this thought. In verse Seven, God announces his intention to reformat the hard drive. He says, I'm going to wipe mankind who I created off the face of the earth. And he has just described the pervasive wickedness of the entirety of humankind and how he intends to destroy it. But notice verse 8. It says, Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. 
The word that's translated as favored literally means to be pleased with or by. So, so God was looking everywhere at people and seeing what was going on, paying attention to what was occurring in the lives of people. And when God looked at Noah's life, he was pleased. He was pleased by what he saw. Now, now don't, don't stretch that too far to suggest that Noah was perfect and that Noah didn't screw up and that even after, as time unfolds, that he's not going to make some big mistakes. We're going to see that a little later in this series. But when God looked at the life of Noah, he saw somebody that was trying to take this whole idea of following him seriously. He didn't see that in anybody else. And appealing back to what we're told in Genesis 5, it is clear that Adam told his story. That he told the story about creation and about how perfect everything was. He told the story about walking with God in the cool of the evening. He told the story about how God had put up this this, this one tree and said, hey, stay away from it, told them about temptation and how he and Eve yielded to it, decided to do things their way and how it messed everything up. Adam told the story about losing the garden, losing paradise, in fact, even losing mortality. How do we know that Adam told that story? Because we still have it today. It kept getting passed on and on and on and on. It went from Adam all the way down to Noah. All of these people before him heard this. They were exposed to this. They were exposed to these stories. They were exposed, exposed to these realities where God reveals himself and reveals the consequences of not doing things his way. And these stories were shared and these stories were passed on, but Noah and Noah alone decides, you know what, I'm going to pay attention to this. His brothers and sisters did not. The, the, the other living relatives of his, of his father, his aunts and uncles and cousins, their kids, their grandkids, their great-grandkids, the, none of these other people who had exactly the same opportunities as Noah had, had the exact uh, ability to be able to hear and experience this story being passed on, they had the same opportunity, but Noah and Noah alone pays attention to it. No, no alone is affected by it. Not only did they have equal opportunity to hear, notice again that phrase in verse, was it verse 7, that says that Noah Noah found favor. This is the end of verse 8. Noah, however, found favor with the Lord. Understand this. God is not predisposed to displeasure. By that I mean this. God is not, by default, operating in fault-finding mode. What God is looking for, in fact, what God anticipates seeing, and what God anticipates experiencing, is pleasure. What God anticipates receiving is satisfaction. And as God would look at the lives of people, in particular by virtue of the fact that Adam is able to share the story and that the message is being shared over and over and over and over, and each of these successive generations gets exposure to it, the expectation of God is that people hear this, that they realize, man, it has messed up everything. Everything has been screwed up. And they decide, you know what, I'd better take God and his standards and his expectations seriously. And God expected to see in the lives of people that that was the case. When he looked at Noah's life, he expected to be pleased, and he was. But he looked at the lives of everybody else and wasn't. But they had the same opportunities to please God as Noah did. They chose not to. We started with the question of this. It's very plain and crystal clear, explained to us, that Noah alone lived righteously among his contemporaries. Noah alone finds favor in God's eyes. How did that happen? Well, there's a plausible explanation. It wasn't geography. It wasn't genealogy. It wasn't opportunity. Well, if it's not that stuff, what exactly is it? Let me answer it this way. 
when I was little, my sister and I would spend our days during the summer over at my grandparents' house on my mom's side. They were a little bit older than those on my dad's side. They were already retired, and so we would go over there and spend our days during the summer. Uh, it was then that I, I developed uh, my understanding of the ABC soap operas. So I, I knew what was going on. It used to be, was it Ryan's Hope? Then it became Loving, All My Children. And anyway, so I knew what was going on there. I knew what was going on in um, on The Price is Right, that type of thing. Donahue, I remember I knew what was going on Donahue. Anyway, so that we would spend our summers hanging out with them. And uh, though I, I was able and did watch a considerable amount of TV, though I spent a lot, a lot of time also outside with my grandfather, just doing odd and end things around the house. Um, do, and he would show me how he used to be a carpenter, and he would show me and would help me build some stuff. And uh, beyond that, though, would work in the yard. And my grandfather took a lot of pride in his yard, and I'm not suggesting it didn't look like Augusta National or anything, but, but it was always uh, really nice, neat, tidy, and clean. And, and he took uh, real pride in that. And because he, he worked consistently and regularly and diligently with regard to that, he wanted to safeguard that as well. And so they had, among other things, some neighbors that weren't uh, particular to their liking, and uh, that was due in part to the, to the kids that these neighbors had, that uh, my, my grandfather thought that these kids were trouble, and I, I think he was probably accurate in that. But on more than a few occasions, uh, either my grandfather would be outside, or maybe he would be in the house and see it out the open door, or see it through a, an open window that uh, one of these kids was either riding their bike through, but more often than not, and walking through his yard. And that was not something that my grandfather could let slide. And so he would go out there and holler at him, say, you get out of my yard, quit walking on my grass, get off my lawn. I'll be honest, as, uh, as I age, I hope that I don't wind up being the old man that's hollering at kids to get off their grass. I don't know, maybe as I get older, maybe I want to be that guy. I don't know, right now I don't want to be that guy. But I will say this. Not only was my grandfather within his rights to say that. I mean, it was his lawn after all. He'd worked on this. He wanted to safeguard it. He was within his rights to say that. It was also reasonable for him to say that because of this. You get to choose where you walk. You get to choose where you walk. They didn't have to walk in his yard, and he was telling them, you better choose a different place to walk. I say that to set this thought up. Verse 9. Look how it ends. Noah walked with God. It wasn't his genealogy, his family line, it wasn't his geography. It wasn't that he had unique and special opportunities. It was because of his choice. He decided to walk with God, even if that meant sometimes walking alone. Walking in solitary fashion. It was because of his choice. And I would say this. If you decide to make that choice even if no one else is with you and even though everybody else would say you're doing so in isolation if you decide to walk with God you are never ever ever actually walking alone so how about you if this passage was written of you and your day what would it say of you would it say of you that God found pleasure in you? Would, would God say in the story of you be written that even in your circumstances that you walked with God? Or are you making excuses? If only I was in a different place. If only I was from a different people. If only I had different opportunities. If only you would start to make different choices. Will you bow your heads with me? So how would your story go? What is it that God would say about you?